The first attempt to distinguish between different types of mental illness was Emil Kreplin's 1883 book, Textbook of Psychiatry. He was attempting to label and diagnose specific types of psychiatric disturbances. Basically, Kreplin had observed that certain symptoms of mental illness tend to be clustered together in large populations. So he referred to these clusters of symptoms as syndromes. And someone who received a particular psychiatric diagnosis might show some of those symptoms, but not necessarily all of the symptoms in a cluster. Uh, for instance, take schizophrenia. We can think of schizophrenia as um, a syndrome, and there are a variety of symptoms that are associated with schizophrenia, but not every person diagnosed with schizophrenia shows all of the symptoms. Some might show some symptoms. Other people with schizophrenia may show other symptoms. But when you look at how symptoms cluster together within a population, then it appears that they are part of the same psychiatric problem. Today, psychiatric diagnoses are made based on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. The most recent version is Edition 5, which came out in 2013. The DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, provides specific criteria for psychiatric diagnoses. For instance, if you look at the DSM, you'll see that it's an incredibly thick book. And if you open it up, you'll see different psychiatric diagnoses and the criteria for each diagnosis to be made. And it's very specific. For instance, you might see a, a group of symptoms and in order for the diagnosis to be made, the individual would have to show three of these five symptoms and then maybe another category of symptoms, they would have to show six of these eight symptoms. So it's very specific. And that's because psychiatric diagnoses have not always been reliable across uh, psychiatrists and clinicians who use the DSM. So it became much more specific in terms of the criteria. However, that means that some individuals with psychiatric problems are more difficult to diagnose. And so there's also a category called not otherwise specified that is sort of a catch bin for people who do not meet all of the criteria for a particular psychiatric diagnosis. The DSM authors tried to avoid speculation about causes and preferred treatments. And that's because psychologists come from so many different theoretical perspectives. We'll be talking about, per we've talked about personality theory, and you know that there are psychoanalytic theorists, people who follow Freud, you know, they're cognitive behaviorists, radical behaviorists, cultural psychologists, and so on. And depending on your theoretical background, the explanation for causes of, me of psychiatric problems will differ, and depending on your theoretical perspective, the form of therapy might differ. So the authors of the DSM tried to avoid any speculation about causes or preferred treatment. And the DSM is dynamic and changing. It's in its fifth edition, although I remember when I was in graduate school, it was a DSM 3R, or maybe a little after that. But basically, it was a third edition revised. So it's gone through revision after revision after revision based on the newest research. Some examples of how the DSM has changed over the years. Today, the DSM rarely uses words like neurosis or psychosis. These are Freudian terms, and not every individual using the DSM is a follower of Freud or a psychodynamic theorist. Um, the word neurosis involves a fixed use of defense mechanisms so that it interferes with an individual's daily life. And you know about defense mechanisms because we already studied Freud. In contrast, a psychosis, uh, from a Freudian perspective, involves a breakdown of the ego 
and the person loses contact with reality. So we use those terms in our daily lives, but the authors of the DSM tried to avoid using them because they do have a Freudian basis. Another example of how the DSM is dynamic and changing is back in 1973, homosexuality was removed from the DSM. And today, if someone goes to a therapist in order to be treated for, I don't know, some type of phobia, then it would be inappropriate for the therapist to also attempt to change their sexuality, change their sexual orientation, or even to imply there's something wrong with a person based on their sexual orientation. So the DSM is dynamic and changing, and those changes typically occur as a result of new research findings, but also cultural changes in our society. We're going to talk about diagnoses in the DSM in just a moment, but first I want to introduce you to the term etiology. Basically, this is a search for causes of psychiatric problems. And I also want to introduce you to the diathesis stress model, which we tend to accept today. Uh, thinking back to nature versus nurture, you know that it's never nature versus nurture. It's always both operating in the development of any type of behavior or here any type of psychiatric problem. The diathesis stress model involves the idea that we may inherit a predisposition to have a particular psychiatric disorder, but we may never show symptoms of the disorder. It's dependent upon events in the environment. Uh, we, of course, don't know what type of types of stress or environmental factors would cause a, a psychiatric disorder to occur, and, but we do have evidence that genetic inheritance plays a strong role in the development of schizophrenia or depression or even anxiety disorders. So the diathesis stress model again states that psychiatric problems are the result of both nature and nurture. We may inherit a predisposition to show a particular type of psychiatric disorder, but again, never show symptoms if we're not in an environment that causes those symptoms to appear. Before we start talking about specific psychiatric diagnoses, I want to give you more of an introduction to the DSM. For instance, why is the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, useful, and why might it be harmful? First, the DSM is useful because it provides a shorthand form of communication about an individual's symptoms. If I were a clinician and someone asked me about my new patient, I might say that the individual is schizophrenic. And that conveys some information about the individual's symptoms, although certainly not specific information. But it is a shorthand form of communication. The DSM is also useful because it permits research. And we can do research in order to make predictions about diagnoses. For instance, some psychiatric disorders might alleviate with time, and over several years it may be that the symptoms generally improve. It might also be the case that um, a psychiatric disorder might, at least for most people based on the research, worsen over time. And so this allows us to make predictions uh, about individual cases. Now, the DSM allows research, um, and that permits us to test effective treatments. We might discover that one form of therapy is effective for a particular psychiatric disorder, better than other types of therapies, and that some other psychiatric disorder is better treated with a different form of therapy. Essentially, the DSM allows us to categorize individuals based on their symptomology so that I can look at a group of people with a particular psychiatric disorder such as schizophrenia and some of those individuals might be treated with one form of therapy and the others treated with a different form of therapy and perhaps a group with no therapy or delayed therapy for ethical reasons and essentially um, we need these 
categorizations in order to make these comparisons. The DSM can also be harmful, according to many experts. For instance, naming a disorder is not equal to understanding the disorder. Years ago, when I lived in New York City, I remember walking down First Avenue and seeing a man with no clothes, wrapped in garbage bags, and he was just standing on the corner talking. Um, and I listened to what he was saying, and it didn't actually make any sense. It was very fluent sounding, though. But if someone had been with me at that moment and asked me why is the man behaving that way, I would have said he was schizophrenic, although I'm not trained or qualified to make such diagnoses. But I would have assumed that the individual was someone who was schizophrenic. But that's just a label. That's a name for a group of symptoms. It doesn't mean that we understand how the person developed those symptoms, what types of stressors might have been in the individual's environment, what kind of brain biochemistry changes might have occurred. We really don't know more than this is a label for these symptoms that we observe. So we're not really understanding a psychiatric disorder by just giving it a label. And we need to be careful about that. Furthermore, these diagnostic labels are stigmatizing. If someone is diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder and other people know about it, teachers, friends, family, then they will always view that person through the filter of the psychiatric label. As an example, when I was a graduate student teaching in New York City, I had a student who came to me and told me that she had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and had been dealing with the illness for many years, undergoing electroconvulsive shock therapy, for instance. But she had, with medication, learned to identify when she was beginning to experience schizophrenic episodes. So she was able to um, attend college classes, perform quite well. But the I tried not to let the psychiatric diagnosis change how I perceived her. Um, but I know that there was one situation in her college career where that kind of stigmatization did occur. One of the faculty was not going to let her take a course because the student had informed the faculty member that she had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. And this was a course where the student would need to interact with other people in a professional setting and so on. At any rate, I did, you know, I was a lowly grad student, I spoke to the faculty member and my student ultimately was allowed to take that course, but again, sharing information about psychiatric diagnoses can be stigmatizing for an individual. Furthermore, diagnoses can lead to self-fulfilling prophecies. If someone is diagnosed with some form of psychiatric disorder, it may be that you know, of course, other people see that person through the filter of the psychiatric diagnosis. That will influence the person's behavior. It may be that their perception of the, the diagnosis will affect their own behavior. We don't know the exact means by which this occurs, but yes, if someone is diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder, it's, it's entirely possible that it can lead to self-fulfilling prophecy. But when you speak to experts in the field, people who use the DSM, people who provide therapy, psychotherapy in their practices, they'll typically say that they're very careful and well aware of the potential for harm in using these psychiatric diagnoses. Now we're going to talk about specific psychiatric disorders. And this, of course, is based on the DSM-5, the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, a manual that has been evolving over time based on research studies. And if you look at this list, it's just a few of many psychiatric disorders described in the DSM. Um, if you ever get a chance to leaf through a copy of the manual, you'll see that it's a very thick manual and there are many, many psychiatric disorders described. So I want you to know these disorders 
and I also want you to read in your textbook about the personality disorders. So specifically, I want you to know the categories of disorders shown on the screen. For instance, anxiety disorders include generalized anxiety disorder as well as simple pho phobia. It also used to include obsessive compulsive disorder. We'll talk about that in a moment. I want you to know that in the prior edition, there was a category of psychiatric disorder referred to as somatoform disorders. However, this has changed, and I'll explain that momentarily. Then there are the dissociative disorders, and you need to know that those include amnesia, fugue, and dissociative identity disorder, as well as the major affective disorders, major depression and bipolar, and then the schizophrenias. And I also, not only do I want you to know the categories of disorders and which disorders are placed within each category, I want you to be able to recognize each of these psychiatric disorders based on the symptoms. This will not be too difficult. Most students perform fairly well on this portion of the course.